uh, going forth. Any, if anybody else needs to change their name, you also have permission to do that now. I thought I had that checked before, so sorry about that. Uh, Johnny, I got a quick question. Yes. This is Samuel, Haitian Creole interpreter. Um, yes. So once we are on uh, on the Creole, let's say the Creole channel, both yep. interpreters will be able to listen to themselves. I mean, listen yeah, to should, each other. You should be able. To, yeah, you should be able to hear each other, and then at okay. two o'clock, you should you should be ready to switch off. I'm actually getting ready yes. to turn interpretation on, and okay. we're going to start the webinar. So yeah. Okay, so we can just tell each other switch. That's cool. Wonderful yep. for all. Yeah, and for all of the panelists, you will need to select the panel. As a reminder, everyone needs to be on the English channel if you're listening or participating in English or your or your respective channel. Um, and with that, I'm going to start interpretation now. All right. Could Brian, could you also make sure to hit record? Yep, I'm on it. Great. Let's get started in just a sec, everyone. Thank you. Yep. Um, so we're ready to start the webinar or you need to wait a second? I think we're ready. Okay, All right. I'm going to start webinar now. See you on the other side. Recording in progress. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the educators and school leaders panel. The first day of two in a series of panel discussions with finalist candidates for the Boston Public Schools Superintendent. My name is Carlene Pignato, and I am the principal at the Channing Elementary School and a member of the Superintendent Search Committee. We are offering interpretation today in the seven Boston Public School languages. The interpretation feature has been turned on. And we will see the interpretation slide. Please know that everyone needs to join a channel, including English language learners. Oh, here's a slide. Thank you. We are offering interpretation today in the seven Boston Public Schools languages. The interpretation feature has been turned on. Please know that everyone needs to join a channel, including English speakers. If you want to listen to the conversation in English, please join the English channel by clicking on the globe at the bottom of your screen. To support our ASL interpreters, please name yourself before speaking. Participants, please know that if you would like to have an ASL interpreter box larger, you can pin with panelists by clicking on the three buttons in the top right of the box by selecting PIN. Today's meeting is being recorded to serve as a resource for school committee members and to make available for those who cannot be here today. To preserve the integrity of this process, the candidate is using a Boston Public, School, Boston Public Schools issues lab, issued laptop and is not allowed to use their phone during the panel interview. The superintendent search committee has been tasked by the school committee to conduct a thorough search. Beginning in March, we began by hosting a series of public listening sessions and community stakeholder meetings. The feedback voiced by students, families, educators, and other community partners was incorporated into the superintendent's job description <clears throat> and informed the search committee members interview questions. Beginning with 34 candidates, the search committee narrowed the poll to eight candidates. The search committee narrowed the poll to eight candidates throughout May and June and conducted several rounds of interviews with the candidates. On Friday, June 16th, the search committee conducted its final deliberations and voted to select a group of finalists for the school committee's consideration. Two candidates have since withdrawn from the process prior to the start of the public interviews. The two final candidates are Mary Skipper, superintendent of Somerville's public schools, and Dr. Tommy Welch, 
Regent One Superintendent at Boston Public Schools. Today's panel is with Mary Skipper, and tomorrow will be with Dr. Tommy Welch. Before we get started to the agenda, I'd like to briefly introduce members of our panel who are also community partners. They will interview Mary Skipper. Participating this afternoon are Nima Avishia, Kafunda Banks, Dr. Michelle Isan Smith, Jason Gallagher, Raul Garcia, Francis Pina, and Dania Vasquez. Each panelist has prepared a question, and I will mix the panel panelist questions with questions from the public. We've drawn from the suggested questions that many of you suggested at the uh, public listening sessions and through the superintendent search survey that we launched in March. We also invite you to submit your questions live using the Q&A function in Zoom at the bottom of the, your screen. We'll ask a limited number of live questions as time permits during our 90 minutes together. At this time, I invite Raul Garcia from our panelists to kick us off with the first panelist question. Hello and good afternoon, Ms. Skipper. How are you? I hope you are well. Um, I, I am a long-term teacher in Boston Public Schools. This is actually my 25th year of teaching um, and have happily served BPS for many years. And I am currently a teacher at the Boston Arts Academy. As you know, we have gone through a wild few years, but my main question based on this and from my experience comes from this idea of supporting teachers. How many are, how can Boston Public Schools help make teaching more sustainable and attractive to talented educators in order to both attract and retain quality long-term teachers like myself? Great. Well, congratulations on your milestones. Um, you know, I, I think the, the last few years um, have been difficult in general in education, but particularly on teachers who, you know, are with the students all day on the front line um, of the classroom. I think, <clears throat> I think, you know, I'm particularly concerned for teachers who started their teaching career or who are very young in their teaching career during the pandemic, because they didn't have the advantage that we all had as we were beginning teachers. Um, you know, and just my experience with my teachers in Somerville, it required us having extra supports and mechanisms for, for our teachers, which can, you know, include strong mentoring programs between veteran teachers like yourself and new teachers, um, additional instructional strategy and pedagogy strategies for, for teachers in terms of PD, um, <clears throat> peer group supporters or peer supporters. Um, if, a, if a teacher is in their second, third, fourth year, and they're still struggling in a particular area and that they want to get better at. So I think as a system, we need to put together a lot of supports um, that are tiered and depending on where the teacher is, they have access. In general, when we kind of talk about the human capital kind of process, we put, we put a lot of focus on hiring and recruitment, but we don't put as much focus on development and advancement. Mm. And that actually is the thing that I think most influences retention. So I'd like to really kind of dig down and see what we have going on here um, around how to develop our teachers, what's, open, you know, what, what for professional development, what's choice, what is the types of professional development that we, we deem as needing to be across all teachers. Um, I think post pandemic, uh, all educators, you know, can benefit from having de-escalation, trauma sensitivity training, anti-bias training. There's, there's a number of things that I think could help just every teacher in every classroom. So very much would like to, to sort of look at that piece on the development side. And then in the advancement side, I think, you know, um, you know, my daughter has been a teacher now for a decade. And, um, you know, she's thinking, you know, do I, do I, am I stay teaching? Will I someday be an administrator? Um, and I would want us as a system to support the aspirations of our teachers. I think it's important for them to feel that there's going to be on other avenues, whether that's coaching, you know, whether that is um, specialist work or whether that could potentially be administrative or leadership work. So I would really like to put a lot of emphasis in the, the pipeline development. Um, finally, I think, you know, it's, it's, on, it's, on, it's our job to support our school leaders so our school leaders in turn can support our teachers. 
And so I think having the right social emotional supports, just given all that's ha happened with the pandemic, so that teachers aren't trying to be social workers at the same time that they're trying to teach um, or nurses. And so making sure that the resources in our school are balanced um, in a way that enables teachers to really focus a lot on their teaching um, and you know, making sure that ratio of resource is right. And that our school leaders um, are able and have themselves been developed so that they can give constructive feedback to the teachers. I think one of the most powerful parts of evaluation um, is frankly the conversation that happens between a teacher and their supervisor of what, what am I trying to accomplish? What do I hope you see? And then the feedback of what I saw, you know, all the positive things, and here's a few things you could work on with some strategies. That takes development of our school leaders. And I think, you know, the pandemic has kind of wreaked havoc along all of those lines of development that we need to get back to. Um, so frankly, we're all prepared to serve the children in front of us. Thank you for that time and your response. I appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Carlene speaking. Thank you. Next up, we have Dr. Michelle Ispon smith Hold on a second. Can you please? Oh, there. Okay. Great. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Michelle Eisen Smith. I serve as the school leader at the Horace Mann School for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. My question is re related uh, to providing services for uh, the traditionally marginalized students, students with disabilities, multilingual learners, linguistic minorities including our deaf and hard of hearing students. That's been identified as a strong needed area of growth in BPS central office. So if you were to become superintendent, what might be some of your strategies for partnering with school leaders, stakeholders, and the district offices who might actually have differing approaches to inclusion, equity, anti-racism, and ableism around dual language learning especially with students that possess intersectional identities? Hmm. I appreciate that question. So I think, you know, I think that there's been a lot of data and auditing around particularly special education, ELL work, um, and intersectionality where, you know, the two are coming together. Um, I would want to, you know, go in, take a look at that data, but I would want to validate it. You know, I want to have good stakeholder conversations with the school leaders and with educators about what's happening in the field. You know, is this, is this the data that we're experiencing? Does it fully represent what's going on? Um, are there areas that are a particular concern and others that we don't need to prioritize? So I would see that as an authentic dialogue with the field, not just accept at face value, um, you know, what's been audited and, and the data that's, that's collected. Um, you know, in our system, you know, we between special education, ELL, and the intersectionality, you know, it's it's 40, 45 percent of our students. So this isn't just a, a small issue. This is a large issue that we need to get right. Um, you know, we have to be true to our mission that we serve every child. And every child means with open arms, welcoming those with different abilities and welcoming those who are newcomers or speaking another language other than English to begin. Um, we have to have the systems and the structures at Central that are then clearly and coherently presented to the field that allows that to happen. And that isn't just in the teaching and learning side. That's in the opportunity side. Because learning doesn't stop at three o'clock. That means that our students who have, you know, our special education students or our ELL students need to be able to access all the opportunities that we have in the after school programs, in the evening programs, in the summer programs to really be true to our mission of full education for our student body. So I would see this as an area based on both what's sort of been identified um, and also just knowing in you know, my experience in education, both in BPS and Somerville, that this is, this is an area that needs constant monitoring support, you know, continuous progress monitoring, looking at the data, talking with families, talking with students, talking with educators. Are we making the progress in the areas that we need to be making and making the difference to the students? So this would this would absolutely be uh, one of my priority areas coming in. Thank you. Next up is Dania Vasquez. Thank you. Hello, how are you? I don't know Thank if my well. video is on though. 
It's not. It's not. <laughs> Maybe there's a little glitch there. Hi, Mary. How are you? I'm doing well, Danya. <laughs> it's good to see you. Um, and so um, I'm going to ask about autonomous schools. Um, and let me just introduce myself properly. Um, I am the founding headmaster of the Margarita Muniz Academy, which is celebrating its 10th year uh, this year. Uh, it brings me to 11 years here working as a Boston public school leader proudly, um, but some, some years before working in, in a different capacity uh, with many of the schools in, in Boston. Um, the autonomous schools, were, uh, schools work started back in the 90s as a laboratory for innovation and systems change, as well as a strategy for um, school improvement. Um, a superintendent who actually started an autonomous school here in Boston, would you describe your position on autonomies and innovation today? And how do you propose to work with this important model in ways that benefit all students and schools throughout the district? So I really appreciate that question. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, whenever I think of autonomy and um, innovation, I always have to add the word accountability. Um, and I know that autonomous leaders feel the same. Um, you know, they have to all work together to ensure that the outcomes for students are what we all need. Um, I think one of the things that has never fully happened that I believe is at High School Network, we were getting to the point, um, but it's the ability to share the practices out of the autonomous schools and into the um, non-autonomous schools at, you know, at the high school level and at all levels. Um, and there is trade-off there. Um, so for instance, there are some things, you know, be it in curriculum or be it in um, scheduling that might be in a bit more control um, and able to be to be given and flexed to other schools. And in those cases, it would be very powerful to have partnerships between an autonomous school and between a non-autonomous school to, th to think about what could happen. Um, and I'd love to foster that. It's actually been a model that's been fostered in other countries. Um, however, there's sometimes that autonomy also teaches us things that there are not replicable. And in those areas where they're not replicable, we sort of have to ask ourselves, is the autonomy a healthy autonomy that is, that is allowing the autonomous schools to achieve, but maybe also contributing in areas to the non-autonomous schools that might not be causing those schools to achieve? And I think that work is hard because no one likes to give up autonomy once they have it. But I think there's probably no more critical work to do as a network. I think this is a leader conversation and an authentic one that has to happen to problem solve where and how we use the autonomies and where and how we might rein back the autonomies a bit in areas to ensure that students have more choice and that students can be more successful. So, and that may be in programmatic areas, that could be in enrollment areas. I mean, I think there's a number of places. So I, you know, my, my, my feeling and my style um, would be to have this dialogue because I think it's extremely important. And what I know about the autonomous network and what I also know having supported the whole high school network you know, in, 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 in our schools, all of our leaders care deeply that every kid learns. All of our leaders care deeply that every student succeeds. So that's where we have to come together to solve some of some of these issues. But again, autonomy and innovation used responsibly with accountability is an amazing, amazing thing. Um, I think, do I have a, a, a minute for a follow-up, my, uh, my friends? Um, you used the word maybe rein in some autonomies and I know that probably perked up a lot of ears. Can you just kind of follow up what you mean? And you also use the word accountability can you just expand that out a little bit so that there's no misunderstanding out there in the field? Sure. So when you have freedom, right? When you have freedom and accountability to something, I mean, uh, and autonomy to something, you want to make sure that it's working for the reasons that it's working. And that reason would be to make sure that kids are making, have opportunities and that they're making progress. So I would, I would want to develop a common lens of accountability to say, what is, what's the data points we can agree upon as a network that says, students are making progress. Students are actually, you know, we're, we're, when what we're doing with curriculum, with what we're doing with governance, with what we're doing 
um, you know, with our with our budget, that all of that is working for students. Um, and in most cases, in my experience, the autonomous schools actually go overboard on this, right? Which is that they actually have lots of layers of self accountability. They're not always known. They're not always public, but that would be an important thing to share as other ways that our leaders are really determining that students are making forward progress. Um, when I say rein in, what I mean is, you know, you, you're always in continuous monitoring, you're always sort of saying, is the autonomy having the positive impact you're wanting it to have? And is it in any way having a disparate impact on others? And I think it's looking at that. And I think like weighted student formula is a good example of that, right? And weighted student formula, if you don't keep going back and checking and looking at the values, it can easily be skewed to impact some schools positively and other schools negatively, particularly if they're small schools or they're not programmatic schools. So I think it's just looking through a lens, like an equity lens across the district. And that's to me like a really, I know that when we started to do this, um, and the issue at the time, I believe, was special education and the issue was, um, you know, inclusion and ensuring that, you know, students could be served in all schools. The Autonomous Network came forward and said, how can we do this? What can we do? And they came together and had a very powerful dialogue, different than a traditional programmatic or special education program, but, but found ways to be able to serve special education students in their model. And the bottom line was they could serve students in their model. So that's what I mean about looking at autonomy through uh, through this dual lens of positive impact and system impact. And I believe knowing the autonomous leaders that they are more than capable of having that dialogue and being problem solvers. I think I have 30 seconds. I'm gonna ask you a yes, no. Would you agree to exploring re reinitiating school quality reviews as yes. a, a system of your accountability? Yes, because I think that school quality reviews get it more than just test data. I think school quality reviews are really important and impactful tools for getting at the culture of the school, getting at whether or not it's reaching its mission. Probably the closest thing to it at the high school level is NEASC. And that's just too broad of a process and takes too long. I think school quality reviews are just very impactful information for our school leaders. Thank you, Mary, appreciate it. You're so welcome, good to see you. You too. Eileen speaking, thank you. Next up, we're going to ask a question from the public submitted anonymously through our superintendent search survey. The question is, as the superintendent, you will have to fill key executive positions that have been open for years. How would you tap your network, both in the public and private sector to convince the best people to come work for the Boston Public Schools? Hmm. So this is an amazing school system. <laughs> People need to come to work and commit to mission. I think you have to be clear about what it is that we're trying to accomplish. I think the power of the messaging, you know, we have 85, roughly 85% of our students are students of color who have been traditionally marginalized. If you're in education, the imperative to be part of a solution is here. That's what we need to galvanize around. If you are out in, you know, in a nonprofit, in a philanthropic, or you know, wherever you are, kind of on sideline, now is when you need to come. This is a se sense of urgency for our students. So I would be trying to tap into networks that I've developed, colleagues I've worked with over the years, and asking my my colleagues here to do the same to get people who are gonna to commit to that mission no matter how hard it is, no matter how much hard work it takes to come and be a part of something bigger. You know, jobs are jobs. This isn't a job, right? The work we do here in the Boston Public Schools is not a job. This is a, it's a calling and a mission to support our students and families. And, you know, wherever you are in your career, I would wanna have authentic conversation with people about the why of the now and the how to get them here. So that that would be, that is going to need to be a big focus for the superintendent coming in because you need people that are committed to be doing the work. And so I'll be spending a lot of time doing that, I imagine, if I am offered a position. position. Okay, Thank my you. turn to translate right now. Speaking. Next up is Kofunda Banks. Okay. <clears throat> 
Good afternoon. Um, my Hi. name is Cassandra Banks, and I'm an criminal analysis specialist at the Curly K through eight school. Meu nome é Cassandra. Eu sou analista do comportamento especialista do Curly K. É, até do oitavo ano, já mais a plane. All right, I'm sorry. If we can just stop for one second. We have one of our interpreters that's on the English channel. So, all interpreters, please make sure you're on your assigned channel. Thank you. So, how would you, as superintendent, um, plan to listen and, and elevate their voices? And how would you plan to ensure that people of color can trust your leadership? Hmm. So looking through the survey data, um, which I spent a lot of time looking through, um, even before making a decision to apply, it became really clear to me that particularly for our communities of color and our families of color, that there's, you know, there is a feeling that there isn't trust and that um, there isn't transparency um, in good communication. And this is something that we need to change pretty quickly. Um, I think that, and, and this is long, I think it's long historical, right? And it, it doesn't just exist here in Boston. It certainly exists in Somerville as well. Um, I, I've, I've always tried, I've, I've always worked, um, whether it was at Tech Boston um, in Boston um, as the network suit here for the high schools um, or whether it was um, at Somerville, I've always worked in a system where it was majority students of color, majority students for whom they and their families English was not the first language. Um, and so I think there's a, there's a couple things to this. I think one is that as a white leader, I, I have to recognize that it, it is an imperative for me to build a team that is diverse, that's talented, that's you know culturally proficient, that is linguistically proficient, um, so that I have a way to be able to reach out to the community of color and our bilingual community um, so that I can hear and listen. Um, and that is the part I may not be able to understand their experience, but I can listen and I can commit to making their priorities our priorities. And I think they are the same priorities, which is to ensure that our students, particularly our students of color who have been marginalized over the years, that, that we are taking our resources and our talent and our programming, and we are putting them to the benefit of our students. The best way to do that, I think, in my, in my experience is to listen, to be open, to be able to take up some of those priorities, and most importantly, to do what I say, to actually do it. So that it isn't just saying it or smiling and nodding, but that it translates into a difference for the community of color, that they see the issues that, that they're concerned about being addressed and being addressed with sincerity and with, with urgency. So that would be my approach. That's been my approach when I was a principal at Tech Boston. That was my approach when I was the, you know, the assistant soup in the high schools um, and in Somerville. Um, you know, family engagement and having an extremely strong family engagement department, our communications office and making sure our communications office at all levels is ensuring access um, to, our, to our broader community and community of color and bilingual community is going to be essential. So I would be working hand in hand in partnership with them. Um, and, and really, um, after a year, my hope would be that they would see some immediate difference. Thank you. You're welcome. Carleen speaking. Thank you. Next up is Jason Gallagher. Hi, good afternoon, Ms. Skipper. Good afternoon, um, Jason. It's great to see you. Um, my name is Jason Gallagher. And I am the school leader at the Harvard Kent uh, K to six school in Charlestown and um, the incoming school leader at Boston Latin School. My question for you is uh, regarding school leadership. So the Boston Public Schools has struggled to retain school leaders, especially leaders of color, due in part to the overwhelming demands the position requires. In your experience as a leader, what specifically have you done to support school leaders? And what will you do to help retain high quality leadership in the Boston Public Schools? Thank you. Thanks for that question. So I think what was very glaring in the pan, you know, post-pandemic, but you know, our school leaders were caught in between. They're caught in between a cent central offices 
and they're caught between students and families and trying to, and staff and trying to serve them. And so everything rolls up and everything rolls down and the school leader becomes the catch pin for it. And having been a school leader for 11 years, I experienced that as well. I think, you know, the pandemic has definitely, you know, um, really brought that to a height. Um, and, and so I would, I guess, approach a few things. I think one, um, the same issue for teachers exists for school leaders, which is development. You know, ensuring that school leaders are developed and have training in critical areas like de-escalation and trauma, communication, um, you know, relative to families, um, safety protocols, you know, all of the things that as a school leader, you need now more than ever. Um, I would make sure, you know, I want to make sure that we were doing good, comprehensive training for school leaders. Um, I would put particular supports in place for school leaders who are here one to three years. I think, you know, I, I remember not feeling totally comfortable as a school leader till after my first graduating class. So that was like year five. And that's where I really started to kind of feel like, okay, I can do this. I know what this is. Um, so I think really paying attention to that, like one to three to four year, particularly with the pandemic interrupting um, and bringing in partners to do some explicit principal work. Um, you know, not just relying strictly on central, but having partnerships that can work with those principals and that principals would have the ability to be able to talk with them different than their supervisor. I think that that kind of outreach and outlet is, is healthy for the principals. I also think principals need each other. And I think, you know, developing networks for the principals, um, particularly for the principals of color, having affinity group so that they are able to talk about particular issues that are unique for them. Um, you know, I think that outlet is going to be important. Uh, for the central staff, um, I mean, anyone that's worked with me at the central level knows that, um, you know, I, I believe that central should be should be school facing um, in everything we do. Uh, we're here to serve. We're here to make sure that the schools have and the school leaders have the information and the resources and, and the support, um, no matter what the issue. And so I would want to really look at how things are configured right now, listen to the principals in the field to, to hear what is um, what is happening and what's not, and then work within our central office um, to make sure that we can get more seamlessly to you what you need. Um, so there'd be a number of things that I would want to put in place for the principals. And for the seasoned principals, the ones that have been here, you know, five or more years and really kind of seen enough, you know, I think that there's opportunities there for mentoring. I think there's opportunities there for leading collaboration and sharing. Because sometimes all it takes is just picking a phone up to a colleague who has an answer um, and giving your question and just having that human voice on the other side say, oh, you've done this. You've been through this. Okay, this is what you do. So I would want to I would want to foster that. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Carlene speaking. Thank you. Next up, we're going to ask to we're going to take another question from the public, which was submitted anonymously through our superintendent search survey. And here's the question. What are your ideas to modernize the curriculum to be aligned with younger generations instead of using the same tools from 30 plus years ago? For example, updated reading materials or new technology in the classroom. Mm. So um, I guess, oh, okay, I'll answer that in a couple of ways. So um, I, I think innovation is a really powerful thing, but um, I think innovation for innovation's sake is not. So the first thing I would want to know is what's the problem we're trying to solve? And then I think you can start thinking about being creative and innovative and what we do with that, as long as it's actually getting to our goal. Um, so newer doesn't always mean better. Right, um, but what needs to what needs to to be the fit is first of all with curriculum. Like, is it relevant? Do our kids relate to it? Like, is it culturally relevant? Does it does it speak to our students' experiences? Do students see themselves in it? So I would look at curriculum not so much as the date, but more how are students receiving it and how are teachers that are teaching it receiving it. Um, and does it get does it does it address the academic standards and goals that we're trying to accomplish? Um, same thing with any kind of project based learning. Um, on the technology side, I think you know the the one part I would really like to look at because I, I think in general BPS does a really good job 
um, with technology and with the devices and the support of the devices and instructional technology. But, you know, I think that when I think of technology, I think of, you know, tools. I think of different kinds of tools. I think of data systems and dashboards. I think of things that can give us information we need to do something actionable. Um, but I also, I, I think with the, I think with the technology, one of the biggest disruptors from even before the pandemic, but the pandemic has been social media. Um, it is countless how many times we have conflicts for students and the root of it is not in school. The root of it isn't even out of school. The root of it is social media. And we have to, I think, as a system, figure out how to harness social media, not so much for adult communication, but for student communication and really meet the students where they are with this in a way that, that they learn to be informed consumers of it. So being able to tell the difference of what's real, not real, healthy, not healthy, but more important that they are actually makers of it, that we can use this in a way to actually further our own student skills and bring it into the classroom to be able to, to kind of get them more engaged and motivated. So I think there's lots to do in that, in that question between looking at materials and curriculum and, you know, reading, I mean, developing culturally responsible reading libraries in each of the classrooms is critical for our youngest students, um, you know, so that it's inclusive and that our students most importantly see themselves in it. Um, and then at the, the older level, I think you start to really get to choice. And I think that's where at the middle and the high school level, it's taking on and really working, you know, in, with our libraries and with our curriculum areas to, to be able to give um, students the choice of the type of material that they're reading as they're gaining skills. Eileen speaking, thank you. Next up is Nima Ovishia. And I apologize if I'm mispronouncing names. Hi there. Uh, my name is Nima Avashia. I'm a teacher at BCLA McCormick, um, and I've been here for the last 19 years. Um, over the last two and a half years, our school communities in Boston have experienced an unprecedented level of challenge. Many of our young people are struggling academically and emotionally and don't have enough support. Many educators are on the verge of leaving the profession. And the twin pandemics of COVID-19 and systemic racial injustice continue to induce strain for many of our families. As superintendent, what steps would you take to create a stronger culture of care and support for educators, students, and families in our school district? So this is a good universal question, right? I mean, this is the struggle everywhere, um, you know, and certainly is in some um, I So I think, I think creating authentic conversations is one piece to understand what's going on for our students, for our educators um, in, in the school community. Um, and then I think resources, um, again, going back to sort of like, you know, don't ask the teacher to do everything and be everything, but making sure that the schools have the resources that they need, social, emotional, out of school time, uh, physical resources, uh, you know, as well as academic um, to support the students that are there and meeting them where they are. Um, I think this is one that's going to take us a little bit of time to come out of because it took us a bit of time to get into. And I think, you know, the, the more that we can create the conversations, create the networks that feel supportive, make sure that Central is school facing so that schools don't feel isolated and alone or on an island. These would all be the things that I think would need to happen um, to reinforce for our teachers, to reinforce for our school leaders, that they're not alone, they're here and they're supported. And for our students, I think it's getting those resources directly to them and their families. Um, and that is not just until three o'clock. I think that we have to look at a menu that expands um, so there isn't a resetting, but rather it goes longer and potentially in the evening as well as um, summer-wise by using our partners and having our partners married with some of our resources, building out programming that will help our students um, to, to be able to address some of the some of the kinds of crisis that they've gone through um, over the last two and a half years. So it would be sort of a real multi-prong approach, but it, it has to start with the conversations to identify what resources are needed and then getting them there. Thank you. You're welcome. Arlene speaking. Thank you. Next up, we're going to take a question from the public, which was submitted anonymously through our superintendent search survey. Based on your understanding of Boston Public Schools, 
what are the root causes of underperforming high schools and how might we bring those schools up to their full potential? So, um, so I, I'll, I'll caveat this to say, um, thank you for the question, Carleen. Um, so I'll, I'll, I just wanna say the caveat that um, I've been gone seven years and I am a learner and I also need to learn. So I am not gonna make assumptions about what is and isn't going on without first talking to the field and validating it. But I'll speak, I'll speak to sort of what has traditionally been, been the root. And I think there's some key areas of the cent of central organization that we need to look at. I think one of them is enrollment. I think one of them is looking at, you know, how do students go to the specific schools that they're in? And is there any thought that the resources that the students need are actually at those schools? Um, you know, open seats, you know, some schools tend to bear a lot of the open seats. And what happens is students are in and out and they can't get traction with the students. And so I think it's really important to create as stable of a school environment for all schools as possible. So what might be the things we can do through enrollment to have that happen? Programmatically, I'd wanna sort of look at this. I alluded to this a little bit in my question um, that Danya asked, but programmatically, I'd wanna look special education, uh, English language learner, SLIFE, programming. I want to look at where are they positioned? Um, you know, what's the best practice that's happening in some of some of the schools that they're positioned in? Which schools are uh, willing and able to take on some programming to be able to distribute so that students have more choice and, and schools can train resources to a smaller population of students rather than um, across many, many programs in one building. Um, so I'd want to look at that. Um, I think um, knowing our students when they come in, when they set foot is really critical to high school success. Um, students start telling us in fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, you know, what's happening for them, right? They tell us through their attendance, they tell us through behavior, they tell us through their academic performance. Um, you know, they tell us in a lot of ways where they are and how engaged they are. And so it's just really pivotal that that transition from eighth to ninth, or if you're a seven to 12, six to seven, that that handoff really happens well, and that you get as much of a snapshot of that student as possible so that you can, before it's an intervention issue, really be proactive and put the resources in place. So looking at the data, talking to the sending schools, having processes built into BPS for that to happen. I mean, that was frankly, you know, when we talk about underperforming high schools, you know, oftentimes you'll find large dropout, you know, characterized, large chronic absenteeism characterized, low drop, low graduation rate. That was exactly what we sort of tackled at a at a high school network level. And, you know, what we what we pretty much found was um, that that the, that unless we developed out options for students who were coming in, who were really off track, disengaged, and unless we built out like true educational options for them at all grades going forward, um, that the student coming in and experiencing a traditional ninth grade would just do the same thing that student had been doing in the eighth grade, only much more accelerated. And that then led to dropout. So we literally took the dropout rate, we took the cohorts of the students in the dropout, kind of categorized, you know, kind of profile of the students of who had started to drop off at what grade, who were absence issues, et cetera, and then we basically put resources and solutions to each of that group of kids. And over the course of like four, three, three and a half, four years, we were able to start driving that dropout rate down, which increased our graduation rates. And then we built out ed programs and ed options that allowed students to finish sometimes in a non-traditional way, if that's what they, they wanted and needed, or potentially go on to an ed option, um, an educational option, while they were still in the high school, but getting kind of caught up and getting rebalanced. Um, those, are the, those are the kinds of strategies that we use to do that work. And I think with the underperforming schools, um, the underperforming high schools, those will be the things that we need to tear into to, to get, you know, to drive down the chronic absenteeism, community engagement specialists starting in those younger grades. Um, I could go on about this one for a very long time. I think there's a, a lot to a lot to be done here, but I, I think um, it's it's exciting work because those are our young people, and we don't want them to leave without a diploma and not prepared to take the next step. Carleen speaking. Thank you. Next up is Francis Pina. 
Hello, um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Francis Pina. Uh, I am a Boston Public Schools alum, um, and I am a teacher at Charlestown High School in Turin, finishing my ninth year. Thank you. <laughs> Michelle Wu and Superintendent Casilius recently launched the Green New Deal for Boston Public Schools. This is a commitment to overhaul in school facilities through major renovations and district-wide capital projects. The plan also includes grade reconfigurations to create pre-K to sixth grade and seven to 12th grade pathways for <laughs> students with one-time transitions. Grade reconfigurations, for example, adding seventh and eighth grade to a ninth and 10th, ninth through 12th grade high school, required an expansion of understanding of what is developmentally appropriate for those grades. With more than a dozen K-5 schools expanding to include sixth grade, and three more high schools expanding into a seventh through 12th grade next school year. How would you lead Boston Public Schools to support schools in implementing age appropriate pedagogy for those students and leverage best practices from across our district? Great, thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate the question. Um, so I think, I think first I was excited to see um, in the Green New Deal that Things like ventilation and sanitation and um, maintenance and and, um, and and overhaul was a part of this. New technologies would be a part of it to to bring our facilities more modern. Um, so I just like to say that's that's awesome. Having spent most of my time in a very old old archaic building in Boston in in BPS and spending my time in Somerville in the same kind of building. So I think um, our, you know our students and our staff need to to have that have that opportunity um so i think you know this on on the um on the surface this seems like um what's a grade right what's a grade you know if you're k to five you're going to take a sixth what's a grade what's two grades you know you're nine to twelve you're going to take seven to twelve well i can tell you that when tech boston merged with the woodrow wilson and we took in um sixth seventh and eighth uh it was life-changing because we had to take a culture that was already established and we had to bring students who were part of another culture and you had to bring them together. And for students, it's a lot of change. And so ways that, things that, things that helped us to be able to do it, um, and I, I think do it healthy, we had some overlap of, of teachers, right? So we had some overlap of educators from both so that students, because it's relational, when they would see the person they knew, even though they were in a different building or a new building, they felt okay because Mr. Jones was there. Somebody that they knew that they saw was there. So I think having some kind of overlap. We did a lot of transition work. So understanding who the students were before they came to us, getting as much information from the previous grade in the old school to bring them into the new school. We had groups of teachers working on the curriculum development. So, you know, Again, if you're going fifth to six, you've never seen the students as sixth graders. You've never taught them, even though many of them are yours, right? You, you have the relationship, but not necessarily have ever been through teaching that particular type of curriculum. So we had groups of teachers and focus groups really working on what that teaching would look like, on what the curriculum would look like, what um, project base would look like in our particular school. Um, I think in the going backward, you know, which is what we did on the sixth, seventh, and eighth, the part that was um, the biggest change for us was we were dealing initially with high schoolers and high schoolers are at a certain level of regulation and maturity. And then you go backward and you're dealing with seventh and eighth graders and they may not be. And then you add that to the change. And for a staff that had never dealt with younger students, it was it could be very overwhelming. So I think it has to be done really in a handoff. I would I would. I would hope that um, those that are going to be making that change have the opportunity to go out to schools and see a sixth grade if they've never taught it or see a seventh and eighth grade and see and talk, you know, talk as best practice with colleagues about how they do the schedule and how they run it um, so that they are best prepared in making that transition. Um, because it is a big transition when you change the grade configuration of a school. You can do it and you can do it successfully but it takes a lot of work and there will be wrinkles. So that's where Central has to be prepared to support that change. 
Thank you. Um, yeah. And if I may add, I do you um, in in implementing some of that support and that collaboration, um, do you see a potential collaboration with the with the local union, the Boston Teachers Union, in that work as you lead us through this, as you have the potential to lead us through this expansion? Oh, 100 percent. I think I think beyond the curriculum, I mean, it gets into everything about the classroom, setting up the protocols for the classroom. Right. So so it is it is I think it's absolutely, you know, for for teachers and leaders to be working together as a team, because that's, in fact, what they need to be when you make that kind of change. So I, I would I would definitely see that being um, the healthiest way through that type of change. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Marlene speaking, thank you. We have been collecting questions live through this panel using the Q&A function in Zoom. We will now ask a few questions live. The first question is, there are many long-term basis administrators in the central offices that have been critical to keeping the district running through many years of leadership change. Their voices and knowledge is often disregarded. What are your plans to overhaul central office leadership and seek feedback from administrators who are not part of the executive cabinet? Yeah. So um, I, as sure as well, I appreciate the, the question. Um, I like to triangulate information. I, I'm not, uh, when I come in, I'm not someone that, um, I look at data. Uh, I like to talk to kids and staff and then, and then administrators. And I try to figure out what's, going on based on that information. So I would want to speak to um, not only e executive, but I would want to speak to those that are supporting the work in whatever role they're supporting. So in this particular case, in the central offices, um, you know, our, our school, our central based administrators, I would see that being conversation. Um, I, I want to hear what the experience has been, where breakdowns might have been, um, how things could be done more effectively um, for communication. Um, and most importantly, all of this needs to point to us supporting schools and students. So that will be kind of my framing, I think, um, if I were to be given the position, is to really ask people what is their role in supporting our schools and our students, what is working, what is not working, and then let them go from there to be able to give me information. And then from that, I will make some suggestions and, uh, and again, try to be as inclusive as possible with our, with our staff. Um, but, you know, I have to get in there and, and really start talking to folks. Carlene speaking, thank you. The next question is, how will you hold schools accountable for engaging in attendance work in schools and following attendance policies and procedures and state laws regarding attendance? What new and innovative ideas do you have about engaging parents in attendance? Okay, I'm just, I'm reading it as well. Um, so I think, so if students aren't here, they can't learn. So being in school is a priority. I think when we talk about attendance and we talk about chronic absenteeism, we have to understand what's going on. I think supervisors of attendance, uh, community engagement specialists, counselors all play a role in figuring out why students may or may not be coming to school. And I think that's where you have to have appropriate resources to draw from. I was really thrilled to see that social workers were now going to be a, you know, a large part of solution set within, in, within BPS. Um, we're doing a similar thing in Somerville. I think, you know, social workers can play such an important role, you know, for families who might have agency involvement, students aren't coming, what is the kind of resource or balance we need to get to that family? The social workers will be great for connecting those. Um, I think, you know, when, when students aren't motivated to come to school, we also have to look at ourselves, right? We also have to look at why might a student not want to come to school? And this is where we have to sort of look at, you know, um, in general, when, when, when people are clear on why they need to do something, what they need to do, and you give them the right resources and supports, they, they do it and they do a good job at it and they feel motivated about it and they wanna do it more. And that holds true for adults. And I think the same thing can hold true for, for students. So, you know, at the core of attendance can often be mental health issues. It can often be caretaker issue at home. 
Um, it can often be an inability to really do the academics. And so therefore it's easier to kind of check out from it. Um, it can be social emotion anxiety, like I can't bring myself. So I think that's where to me, the supervisor of attendance, the counselors, like that attendance team has to really kind of come together and address each of the students from a chronic absentee as an issue. And then, you know, talk about what's the plan and the student support plan and, and resources we need to put in place to have that student come. Home visits are great. Um, I think, you know, supervisor attendance can build that relationship. So can community um, engagement specialists build that, build that relationship with the family, build that relationship with the student. Um, and, you know, sometimes for a student, it's just knowing that somebody cares and notices that they're missing and they want to come back. Um, I'm sure there's many of a teacher that reaches out to the student that's late on that day or doesn't come to school that day. And that's the most positive message that that student's going to get. So really would like to be able to kind of foster um, more ways to interact with the students um, to get them in and, and to figure out if they're not what's at the root cause of it. And then as far as the parents go, I think the parents have to be a part of the process. I mean, I think, you know, whether it's social workers, supervisors of attendance, community engagement specialists, it's really about the family. It's about the family system. And many times parents will be frustrated and say, I, I don't know how to get my kid to go to school. And that, that's where we have to kind of get, you know, have the parent come in, have the family be part of the solution. Um, and it may be adding mental health or embedded health um, or home visits um, with health for that student. Um, but whatever it, the resource it is, the bottom line is, if we don't have that student in school, that student can't learn. So not, attendance is going to be a, a big a big push for, for school performance. I think I got all of it. Carlene speaking. Thank you. The next question is, we've heard a lot about addressing challenges and deficits. It would be great to also hear about a vision for students who are college ready. How do you support them? Connect them to rigorous opportunities that prepare them for post high school experiences and ensure that they remain engaged while in high school. Yeah. So this is a, it's a great question. I think um, you know our success Boston model has worked for a long time here um, and we may need to expand it. I, you know, one of the things that we know is when students leave um, depending on the college that they're going to, that having a network of resources connected back to their school is often really important in the first year and the first summer that they're doing their FAFSA themselves. Um, the early college work is critical to giving students the experience of being on a college campus. Dual enrollment at the school site can be equally because it gives them the chance to do college level um, material, but they can do it in an environment that's a little bit easier for them. So really building up as much as possible, IB, the same thing. I'm building up the opportunities for students to be exposed and for them to be able to, um, in, a, in a supportive um, environment while they're here with us. When they, they go, I think, you know, I would want to look at how is the coaching model working? You know, are there, is that additional resource that, that's needed there? Um, you know, when we kind of see our students go, there's a number of our colleges, local colleges that majorities go to. Um, and those are the colleges that obviously we would want to partner with in a strong way to make sure that they've got a handoff, they've got coaching available, they're able to follow the student. And if there's issues, there's a reach back that can happen, um, you know, to the secondary school side. I also, you know, I think that there are students who in their senior year, um, they may be ready, but they're not emotionally ready. And I would love to see some 13th year programming where students who are not quite ready to make the leap of independence. Um, if they go to a college, they may not be successful for a variety of reasons, but they have enough credit to graduate. I'd like to form some 13th year programming in some of our schools that kind of can hold on to those students part-time, have some of the coursework done at the school or some of the social emotional support done at the school, but then also have them attending some college and some career training. Um, that way they're, they're getting the experience to work, they're gaining skill, they're also beginning community college, and they still have the umbrella of support from within BPS. So programs like that, in addition to the traditionals, the early colleges, the IBs, um, you know, the, um, the dual enrollment uh, kinds of programming. Eileen speaking, thank you. Sure. Next question is, on the secondary level, Instruction is often still teacher-centered. 
with less focus on the creation of daily high level products where students thoughtfully respond to content rather than just capture it and send it back. To what extent do you see this as a concern and how might you deal with it? Yeah. So the, it, this is a major concern because this is the challenge with the internet. It's very easy to cut and paste and it's very easy to ask Siri what she thinks and then have it pop up. So, you know, I think developing project based that's authentic, that really is about building competency for students that they have to demonstrate. And that can include, you know, traditional academic like writing um, or mathematics or science, but at the same time allows them to do it in a way that's applied. Um, I think is is probably the thing we have to gravitate toward to be able to have students actually demonstrate what they've learned and what they know. Um, I think the days are gone where it's just about submitting something written, um, because again, there's just too many influences and too much out there. I think we have to build it in where this is really about students demonstrating, and you know potentially, you know I know in in many of the autonomous schools we you know the the you know the capstone is a, a big piece of that because the capstone is really the summation of everything you've done and learned and being able to articulate it and show it. Um, and so it would be really great to see as juniors and seniors, the ability of students to form capstones in all the schools as a way to hand to colleges, this is what's possible, this is what I can do. Um, but this is an area that, um, you know, I agree, I think, uh, whether it's online classes, uh, you know, and or technology tools, it's just becoming too easy to A, get misinformation and B, to parrot information. And authentic thinking, like real creative thinking has to come from a process. And that process is applying what you know and then having an output. So that is something at the high school level, I'm sure the high school leaders would be interested in, in talking about and addressing. Carleen speaking, thank you. The next question is, several of our recent superintendents have focused on expanding opportunities for students through an equity lens, including detracking elementary grades and adopting a new admissions policy for the three exam schools. How would you continue this work, including but not limited to increasing opportunities at our comprehensive open enrollment high schools? Yeah. So, um, so I mean, this is imperative work. I think that um, one, I would want to see how our students are doing in the exam schools and what additional resources we, we may need to be able to give to our students. You know, I'm a big believer of high expectation, but high support. I think when you create high expectation and then you don't support adequately, you get frustration and you get all kinds of other things. So I would wanna look and see, you know, it's relatively new policy changes, what's additional resources we may need to add in to support our students in the exam schools. Um, in the open enrollment schools, I think this is the solution, you know, this is the, the, the issue in Boston. It should, we should not define a student's success by the zip code of the school that they're going to or the particular school they're going to. We have to branch out opportunities. Madison Park's a great example. You know, Madison Park, it can be the, the gem of the system. I mean, it can be a place in fact, no system can be great without a great CTE VOC school or program. You know, it opens up doors and opportunities. Um, that can be, you know, something that, you know, with with a lot of, you know, with some work, you know, with particularly the unions and the business community, you know, you investing in it, you, you can have a, a school there that starting with sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, you bring them to it. They see what's possible. They see what vocation is. They see what a trade looks like they get excited about it. And by the time they're choosing in the eighth grade, they're, I wanna go. And they're making that choice. Um, same thing with adults. You can open that up in, at night and you know, in, in the afternoons. And for students that might've graduated, but still wanna learn a trade, they have the ability to go back and be able to do it. You can do workforce development programming. And that's just Madison Park. I think if you look at our open enrollment schools, there'd be all kinds of ways to partner with post-secondary for an en enrollment strategy, with nonprofits that are in the area and get philanthropic support to design it and be able to have all these types of programs that students would be able to go to um, in our open centered schools. So it, it has to branch out. It can't just be in these particular schools is the only place that you can succeed. 
Carleen speaking, thank you. Sure. Now we'll answer a few more questions submitted previously through the superintendent search survey with our remaining time. So the first, the next question is, after almost 20 years of English only approaches in educa educating English learners, the district has the opportunity of developing programs that respond more appropriately to the variety of needs that ELS represent, such as students with interrupted schooling, EL students with disabilities, late entrance students, and students needing content area instruction in their own language. What is your perspective on the types of programs that are appropriate for these types of students? Can you please give examples? Sure. So this was actually one of the areas that we were working on pretty closely when I was in the high school network and then certainly in Somerville. Um, so I think, you know, first of all, for our English language learners, our SEI programming and our gen ed access has to be rigorous and with an academic focus of them attaining language, but getting rigorous content. Um, so I think we have to we have to make sure that that is happening. We have to make sure that from a teaching perspective, um, you know, teachers get their SEI endorsement, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're getting coached in a way that's effective for them to be able to address SEI students who are in their gen ed classes. So I'd like to see some coaching done um, and some additional professional development done to ensure that our SEI students are all the way through until they've, you know, they're in their in the gen ed classes. That at each step that they're they're getting access to that to that rigor and that that academic. Um, we absolutely need programs recognizing that students are different, and so are our L's. We have L's who are SLIFE, and for our SLIFE students, and we saw this particularly from the pandemic. Um, you know, our SLIFE students are coming in with often heavy trauma background um, and major interruption not just a couple of grades, but major interruption, um, you know, in their education. So I think, you know, oftentimes with SLIFE programming, we address it just academically, but it really has to be done academically and social emotionally. So I would want to see for all of the students, the ability to have bilingual adjustment counselors providing support for the trauma piece. And what our experience has been um, both at the high school network and then, um, you know, now in, now in Somerville is that students flourish when they're given both sets of supports. Um, I think uh, in terms of our duly identified students, again, you know, students aren't this or that, they're a student. And in that student is a complexity, right? Like there's lots of things for each student. And I think that's where when special education and English language learning comes together, you need people that can recognize and separate both things and be able to work on both together. Um, so making sure that we have teachers who are trained for our duly identified students and making sure that in the process of the IEP process and the process of for our L's, um, their goal attainment, making sure that for the parent and the student that what's being proposed makes sense and is understood. And so I, I think really the interpretation pieces and having a, a cadre of interpreters who know that language, that specific you know, special education and English language learning language and, and, and acronym is, is essential so that for the parent, they understand how a plan for their student addresses both sets of issues. Um, the other thing is, I think at the high school level, we should really be gearing up for the sale of literacy. You know, much as we're talking about early college and we're talking about AP, we should be talking about, you know, bilingual, the syllabi by literacy. And that should be something that our students who are beautifully fluent in multiple languages should be able to, to attain and be able to put on to their, um, to their next step of college. Um, finally, I think for our L programming, uh, it's really, it's critical that, um, that our outside opportunities are open to our Ls. Um, and sometimes that is hard with making sure that there is appropriate interpretation, um, you know, and that materials are communicated and translated appropriately. But the students, all of our students need access to that, not just gen ed. Um, so I think special ed and NELL both need to make sure that the same opportunities we offer other students in the after school, in the summer, in the evenings are open to them as well. Carlene speaking, thank you. Sure. Mary. How will you improve literacy rates in Boston? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've, I've 
read a bit about the balanced literacy and what you're working on. Um, and I think, you know, right now we need to sort of look at what's happened with literacy um, because of the pandemic. I think, you know, we have kind of this gap that's formed um, that, you know, for students who may have been struggling as readers and now they're returning and they're really behind um, and they're not able to access, you know, the, a, you know, particular content. Um, I think reading specialists are going to be critical and part of the solution. Um, and, and, you know, and I think that has to take a form that's different by the grade span. Um, I think how you treat uh, literacy issues in the primary grades is going to look vastly different from how you teach a ninth grader who's coming into you and isn't literate or is barely literate and their willingness to, to let you know that and their willingness to receive the help to support it. So I think we have to we have to look at a menu on this. I don't think it's going to be a one size fits all. And I think there is going to be a period where intervention um, is going to have to be a key component of the rollout for literacy. Carleen speaking, thank you. Sure. Every year, BPS schools, especially small schools, struggle with money. What can you do to ensure every school has enough money for all their needs without having to cut valuable programs. Yeah. So, I mean, I think this is one of the, the issues that's being looked at, you know, around the way to student formula, around consolidation. Um, you know, I think the, the way to student formula and going back and looking at what does it take to actually run a school um, effectively, and then how can you compensate when you have a small school that may not have the dollars based on student enrollment to purchase certain services, um, we probably need to do some thinking about how we might be able to share those services across a coalition of small schools. So if you have a couple of small, small schools that are near each other, or you have two that have grade spans that are com complementary, you might be able to get a support for them that's shared across both. Um, I think we have to we have to look at it. We also have to, you know, I think enrollment is going to be a moving target right now. Um, I think, you know, our my experience in summer rule was that the enrollment was went down severely during the pandemic. And now as time has gone on, um, you know, families are returning, they're returning to the public schools. And so I think it, you know, we'll bear watch on the enrollment for the next year to two years um, to see how that impacts some of our small schools that, you know, a handful of students can really kind of swing it. Um, you know, obviously safe harbor for some of those schools initially um, would be important until the enrollment stabilizes. Carleen speaking, thank you. How will you create new structures and systems within the central office to increase communication and work between departments? How will you boost mo low morale? So, you know, I think low morale is something that exists pretty universally right now, it's been a tough couple of years. And I think, you know, between um, people's personal and people's professional life, it's been tough. My experience is that when, you, when you're clear on the what and you're clear on the why and you're clear on the how, that those three pieces, which should be like the foundations of communication in the central offices and in the schools, that when you're clear in those and you give the right resources and you give the right support, that people can actually accomplish something. They can do it. Um, they get into a flow and that motivates. I mean, we all like to feel like something's in our capacity to do it. And especially when we do it and it makes a difference to others like our students. So I, I would want to identify any barriers that are happening there that um, are our own creation, right? Or who, that are artificial and not just part of the pandemic. And I think address that. And that may be in the communication or that in the working together, or that may be in the resources and the supports. But if we can get those pieces right as a team and teams, then I feel like people's motivation will come up and that morale starts to bounce back and it's, uh, it starts to feel differently. And I think that, you know, this next year coming in is gonna be very important for that. You know, like this year was a very dysregulated year across education. I think next year, the students are coming back, families are coming back, they've been through it for a year. And in, in the hope with the resources that we're adding in, the structures that we're gonna create around communication, teaming and networking, we'll be able to get people to that place where they feel they actually can do the work that's meaningful to them. Carleen speaking, thank you. Our final question has been submitted live 
through the questions and answers function. The question is, the Boston Public Schools policy is that the number one priority is access to native language under the LOOK Act. Do you believe in access to native language? And will you implement these changes in sheltered English immersion? This applies to both English language learners and English language learners with disabilities. So I, you know, I, I honestly would need to dig into how our SEI programming is um, functioning right now. Um, in general, the ability to have scaffolding in the newcomer programming for native language is, is critical. Um, obviously here in Boston, we have so many languages. Um, and so it, that can be hard to construct. Uh, however, I think an attempt to do that, particularly in newcomers, and I think you know, the newcomer programming itself needs to be looked at deeply. What does it mean to be a newcomer? What are the specific supports that we need to put in place for that year one and that year two of SEI um, instruction? Um, and, and not just on the language acquisition side, not just on the academic side, but also on the social emotional side and on, you know, um, familiar, familiarizing with, um, you know, the culture of coming in of what, um, you know, what the school is, what schooling is in general, you know, how schools function. Um, you know, we have created in Somerville newcomer specific academies for this reason, because we found that any SEI ones and twos that were just being put in to a broader population were just not benefiting and in, in being served in the way that they needed to be. And you could see that in the results. So I would wanna look at the SEI models here, understand better what's been tried, what they've been doing, but in general, my feeling is for SEI 1 and 2, newcomer and native language is really important. Marlene speaking, thank you. That is all the time we have for today. Thank you to our panelists for their thoughtful questions, to the public for your participation and engagement, and to Mary Skipper for spending time with us. The full schedule of public interviews can be found at bostonpublicschools.org backslash SUPT dash search. We hope to see you again later this afternoon for a third community panel with students and families for the school committee interview this evening from 5.30 until 7.30 p.m. And again tomorrow for a full day of interviews with Dr. Tommy Welch. We will be taking a 30 minute break between this panel and our students and family panel, which will begin at 3.30 p.m. The Zoom room will remain open during, this, during the break and all participants will remain muted with cameras off. Thank you. Thank you.